at the end of last lecture, so we discussed this LSZ theorem, which tells you how to obtain scattering amplitude from correlation functions, from time order the correlation functions. Okay. So, so if you want to compute, say, some scattering amplitude from alpha to beta, so alpha some initial state, and beta some final state, say alpha is consists of momentum P1 and Pn, a Pm, and beta, say, momentum Pm plus 1 and Pm, and then you can gain get uh, uh, this, um, uh, this scattering amplitude just by taking your momentum space correlation function, okay, for the end point, so all together you have end point for the external momentum, okay, and then you take the unshared limit, you take the unshared limit, and then that gives you the product of the external propagators, Then times the scattering amplitude. Okay. So this is the relation. Okay. So here I have stripped out the momentum conservation on both sides. Of course, momentum has to be conserved inside the total momentum have to be zero. And so this limit is the unshared limit. And in the unshared limit, the, the initial momentum, okay, actually I should call it minus P, uh, 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 sorry, it's minus P M. So, so the initial momentum, uh, uh, for those with the initial momentum, you take P1 to be T10 to have minus omega P1, okay? For the final momentum, say p alpha, for the final momentum, you take the p beta zero to goes to omega p beta, uh, uh, the final, okay, uh, uh, with the plus sign. Okay, so that's how you distinguish the initial state from the final state. Because when you obtain correlation function, uh, you don't distinguish what is the initial and the final state. You, you just have some momentum. Uh, uh, this is a fun function of some arbitrary momentum. But the scattering amplitude, of course, the, uh, those momentum are on shell. And so, uh, so the way you distinguish the initial momentum and the final momentum is by taking the initial momentum, say, to go to the lactive root, and the final momentum to, to take the positive root. But since the alpha it consists minus p1, and then uh, then the initial state you have positive energy. Okay, uh, uh, you have positive energy. So this tells you that when you when we compute the scattering amplitude, when we compute the scattering amplitude, we should take the um, we just take uh, um, take all the Feynman diagrams which you use to calculate these correlation functions, okay, and then you sum over you sum over say the um, truncated so you see. The relation between these green, uh, uh, correlation functions and the scattering amplitude, so they differ by this product. They differ by this product of the external propagators. Okay, so for each external momentum, so here there's a propagator, and just as if that the, when you get the uh, uh, so the um, so this scattering amplitude was would corresponding to this one with all external propagators stripped, uh, stripped. Okay, so that's why. You can see the truncated diagram, not including the external propagators. And you take it on shell. Okay? And also, 
since we are interested on the in, only in the process which all particles participate in the scattering process. So we also only can see the connected diagrams. Okay. Also can see the connected diagrams. Okay. So, so this provides a simplification. Uh, so you get um, uh, fewer diagrams and a simpler expression than you would have got from calculating these correlation functions. Okay. Uh, correlation functions. So any, <coughs> so any questions on this? Yes? Uh, so can you just explain why in this diagram, where, like you have one branch and then there's a loop? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 yeah, I will explain that. Uh, uh, but uh, before that, uh, uh, do you have other questions? OK. So now I will explain two things. OK, the first thing is this sign convention. OK, this sign convention. Uh, OK. So, so remember this GN. So let's go back to the definition of this GN, uh, this momentum space correlation functions. So this is obtained by doing Fourier transform. Say, um, I think maybe minus sign. Okay, by doing the Fourier transform. Um, Yeah, by doing free transform of your coordinate space, uh, a correlation function, the coordinate space correlation function can be written as the following. Okay, so you have phi x1 and phi xn. Okay? So, so now, for those going to the initial state, okay, for those go to initial state, we start from alpha to beta. So then you want those phi corresponding to the initial state to act on the right. Okay, to act on the right. And then you do the free transform. Okay, uh, uh, then you do the free transform. So, so now let's just consider one of them. Let's just say consider you have phi x for the initial state acting on the right, and then you do a free transform. Okay. Okay, you do a free transform. And uh, so so this if you just record the, the the mode expansion for phi and the phi contains a and a dagger and a p is acting on the zero we just give you a zero so only a dagger piece will survive, okay? And a dagger piece is multiplied by say, uh, say you will have, um, say some k, and then have i omega k p plus minus. Yeah, essentially, yeah. Let me just write it in a simple way. You just have exponential i k x. Okay, I think it's exponential minus i k x. So, so you just get the expansion minus i k x. Okay, with k is the unshared momentum. So k is given by omega k and k. Okay. So when phi x acting on the zero, you keep the part which uh, uh, corresponding to the a dagger, and then you get p, uh, a piece proportional like this. Okay. And now when you do the Fourier transform, and then you find just p then your p is just equal to minus k, okay? So that's ready to the minus sign there, okay? Ready to the minus sign there. And also, uh, 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 when your p equal to minus k, then that means p0 is equal to minus k. Okay, so that's where that sign uh, in the initial state comes from. And the same thing with the final state. 
So for the final state, then you need to look at the phi x acting on the left uh, uh, to this, and then you do the free transform. Okay. Okay, do the free transform. And then in this case, this become on the left, it's the A part act on the left. So this gives you k, expansion i k x. Okay? Uh, 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 is the, uh, 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 A act on the left. And then when you do the trans uh, Fourier transform, then here you give P equal to K. Okay? Uh, 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 so that's why in the final state, you just have P equal to K, and then, and then P zero is equal to just omega K. Okay, so this explains the sign. Okay, so this is explains the sign. It's just from whether you act on the initial state or act on the final state, okay? Good. So, so, yes. Like the time ordering of, of, of H1 to HN matter here? Uh, yeah, it, 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 uh, of course, when you derive that, it matters. But here, uh, uh, for this argument, it doesn't matter. It, it, you just have to act to the right. Yeah, but, uh, for the initial state, you have to act to the right. Yeah, yeah of course, to derive that theorem, uh, the time order matters. Okay. Yes? So this was just for a free scalar field theory that you showed that this is true. No, 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 this is not for the free scalar field theory. Yeah, it, it's the we uh, uh, here I just, to tell you the sign convention, okay, you can, you can do this for the full intacting theory. Yeah, just uh, uh, use the free scalar as the, as the, yeah, because when you go to uh, 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 plus or minus infinity, you can, uh, uh, you can just reduce to the free particle. Okay. Other questions? Okay, good. So, so this is the first comment. The second comment is that we need to here, from here we need to truncate external propagator. So we mentioned that if you have a diagram like this, okay, if you have a diagram like this, say minus P1, minus P2, to P3, P4, for a diagram like this, okay? And then the scratching amplitude is just given by minus I lambda. Because you need to uh, uh, throw away all the external propagator. You don't have to worry about the external propagator, okay? Uh, it just need to, uh, uh, you have to truncate all the uh, external propagator. So that means you also throw, uh, throw away diagrams like this, You can consider arbitrary complicated diagram, okay? As far as they only happens, yeah, 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 here, the, it should, uh, don't draw very well, okay? So, so this just the, the touch at one point, okay? So all this diagram, you can ignore them, okay? Because they just corresponding to the correction to the external propagator, okay? Because they don't touch with the, uh, 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 they only, yeah, you can also, yeah, you can do it on, uh, 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 on any of them, okay? So such kind of diagrams, they only change the external propagator, but since we truncate the external propagator, and then uh, 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 they don't matter at all, okay? Uh, and uh, it's, it's all included in this diagram, okay? So the reason is the following. The reason is the following. All this diagram do is just modify the properties of the external propagator. Okay, uh, 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 modify the property of external propagator. And uh, the only way all these diagrams can modify your external propagator is to give you an overall constant. Okay, so that's what this Z corresponding to. So this Z essentially just captures all these different corrections, okay? All these different uh, 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 corrections. And now you are truncated them, okay? Uh, and, uh, and so you don't need to worry about it. So, so Z also have expansion, just one plus order lambda, et cetera. So at the leading order, so Z does not contribute, okay? Uh, you can just set it to one, and when you go to higher order, then the Z can uh, 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 make a contribution. Okay. So you just need to separately take into account the Z, and th th there's no need to contribute 
uh, to calculate those things separately. Yes. Uh, we also can create diagram with loops and keep including them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Any of them, uh, uh, you can do any number of them. Uh, uh, as far as they only uh, uh, can say external legs, uh, 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 it's fine. Yeah, because this only uh, 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 any of those corrections only concerns one leg. Yeah. Yes. That's right, yeah. When you calculate the endpoint function, you have to include all this. But when you calculate scattering amplitude, you don't need to. Don't need to okay. Because in the scattering amplitude, you need to divide by the extended propagator. Uh -huh. And all of these things, they, uh, 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 yeah, all, all these things, uh, uh, it, 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 Essentially, they just modify the, uh, uh, give you the cracking to the external propagator and include it in that constant Z. Yeah. So is Z the same or different for like different processes? Uh, yeah, Z is the same. And, no, Z is the same for different processes, but it's different for different particles. So here, we only have one type of particles, so we only have one Z. But if you have two kinds of particles, then, then Z is different for different particles. Oh, okay. So, like, for example, for, like, let's say a fixed, like, process, let's say, like, three going to three, yeah. Z would be constant for all choices of momentum, right? Am I correct to say that? Yeah, yeah, it's all constant. Yeah, uh, uh, constant for all of them. Yeah. Okay, yeah, because if it depended on momentum, then it would be kind of useless, right? No, 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 it does not okay. depend on momentum. Yeah, yeah just, yeah, it, it just correct. Uh, 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 you see, all such things don't change the momentum. Okay, the momentum don't change. Uh, so we will not go into details of the Z, uh, and that is in the, uh, the QFT2, and so we will discuss how to calculate uh, this Z uh, 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 in QFT2. But the leading order, they don't matter, and so we will start with one. So for our purpose, actually, it's uh, uh, not important. Yes? Are there physical interpretations for like what interactions are included in Z? Yeah, yeah, just the self intact. Yeah, just when you, when you have an intacting theory, so the particle can interact with itself. When the particle propagates, uh, uh, it actually can interact with the virtual particle. It just all comes from this kind of diagram. You have a single particle, and you can have such diagram like this. And all this diagram, all this diagram, because one thing you have a particle propagating, but then particle can interact with the virtual particle, its own virtual particle. Okay, and so the loop corresponding to the, uh, the particle view. It's, so this is the real external particle, but anything coming in the loop, you can imagine are the virtual particle uh, uh, which come out from the vacuum. And then this can be interpreted as the particle intact with its own virtual part. Uh, yeah, some virtual particle coming out from the vacuum. Yeah. And so that, uh, this kind of uh, 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 interaction will affect the property of the propagation. But can at most affect the prefactor, but actually can change the mass too. But for the O, uh, it can correct the mass, uh, and uh, uh, also that's the uh, uh, subject of the PFT2, can correct the mass, and then at most uh, it, can, it can change the overall factor by Z. Other questions? Good, good, okay. Um, good, if you don't have other questions, so let's conclude our discussion uh, of chapter three on, uh, on interacting series. So, so as I said before, as I mentioned before, and now you, you are really equipped with the technique. Now in principle, you can treat any interacting theory. So the technique, even though we just use the scalar theory, but the technique is the same, okay? Just the, uh, for different series, you have different details, okay? And now you have already uh, equipped the foundation, the basic uh, uh, tools for dealing with any interacting series. And for, uh, uh, for the goal of this uh, uh, um, course, uh, we want, in the end, to be able to calculate the, say, interactions uh, uh, in quantum electric dynamics, okay? And for that purpose, we still need to uh, have some other preparations. So now let's discuss how to describe fermions. Okay. So now we describe the scalar and how the scalars interact, and now we talk about fermions.
Okay. So let me say a little bit history. So soon after the quantum mechanics was proposed by Schrodinger and Heisenberg, etc., and then people uh, tried to generalize to relativistic situation. Okay, so that came from this Klein-Gordon equation, which you discussed before. Which uh, this was the first attempt to to write down a wave equation for relativistic particles. Okay, and we discussed before this does not really make sense as a relativistic quantum mechanics. And uh, yeah, the, 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 uh, uh, yeah. But at the time, this Klein-Gordon equation, if you interpret it as a wave equation, uh, suffer some difficulty, suffer from some difficulties. One is that it does not does not have a positive probability. Yeah, cannot define. Yeah, I should say cannot define. Positive definite probability. And the second difficulty is that the hyperlective energy state. Okay. So, uh, so, yeah, of course, as I mentioned before, that this was, uh, there's more fundamental reason that actually uh, 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 relativistic quantum mechanics uh, does not make sense. But at the time, in the late 1920s, people didn't realize that. Okay, people just look at those te uh, difficulties and they thought it's a technical difficulty. So Dirac proceeded trying to crack those difficulties, to overcome those difficulties, okay. So, so Dirac then soon come up. So I think this is around 1926. And then 1928, then Dirac came up with his Dirac theory, his Dirac equation. Okay, so Dirac equation was aimed to cure those problems, okay. So Dirac concluded that the Klein-Gordon equation, the reason had those problems was because of the Klein-Gordon equation have a second order in derivative. And then he said, if we have a first order, uh, have an equation with first order, yeah, he's, he speculated. Uh, if we had the equation with first order in time derivative, just like a Schrodinger equation, and then both problems maybe can be solved. Okay, uh, can be solved. And then, and then uh, uh, Dirac came up with the Dirac, uh, Dirac equation. So it turned out that the Dirac equation solved the first problem, okay, but didn't really solve the second problem, okay. But the level is, uh, 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 again, due to more fundamental reason, you cannot really interpret the Dirac equation uh, as a relativistic quantum mechanics equation, uh, a wave equation for relativistic quantum mechanics. Actually, uh, the Dirac equation should be interpreted as a field theory. So nowadays we uh, interpret this, this is the, gives the field theory. Of course, uh, Dirac didn't know this. So essentially, he discovered the dispute for theory for the wrong motivation, okay? For the wrong motivation. And uh, um, yeah, this happens over and over again in physics, okay? People make great, made great discoveries uh, uh, often uh, for the wrong motivations, okay? But, but the key is that you, if you are good enough, you will find something new. And that something new will be useful, okay? <laughs> and uh, yeah, this Dirac theory is a, a prime example, uh, um, which is actually uh, one of the most beautiful, uh, uh, we will see is this is one of the most beautiful equations uh, in mathematical physics. Um, yeah, but also it's, uh, it's actually described electron, so it's not only beautiful, but it's actually useful. Okay, so, so this, First, uh, I talk about introduce the Dirac equation. 
okay? And, uh, and uh, its covariance. Okay. So the best way to introduce the Dirac equation what still his more, uh, what still his more original motivation is that we want to find a first order equation which is Lorentz invariant. Okay, so the goal is that you write down an equation like a Schrodinger equation, which is first order in time derivative. Okay, but is Lorentz covariant. but it's Lorentz covariant, okay? So, so by Lorentz covariant means, means this equation have the same form when you go to a different frame, okay? Yeah, uh, uh, that's what it means by, uh, uh, just, just when you go to a different Lorentz frame, the equation, the form of the equation looks the same. Just, just different observers in different laboratory, they see the same equation, okay? And so that's what we mean by Lorentz covariant. Okay, so, but for this to be Lorentz covariant, remember Lorentz transformation transform T to X. So immediately you conclude that H must be first order in spatial derivatives. Okay? So, so the only, then the most general way you can write it, so let's try to write the most general, uh, 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 yeah, uh, uh, yeah, let's try to write something like that. So if you first order in derivative, then, then has to have the following form, alpha minus i, yeah, uh, uh, so this is the uh, uh, gradient operator. Uh, yeah, uh, spatial derivatives, and uh, yeah, max i just for convenience. And then this is a vector, uh, uh, have three components, and then have to contract with something, and then we include the alpha. And then you can, uh, uh, at the most, add a constant, okay? So let me just write this for historical reason, uh, uh, write this constant as m times beta, okay? So, so if you look at this equation uh, 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 form, you say this doesn't make any sense, okay? So, be, so alpha and the beta, they have to be some kind of constant, okay? But if alpha and the beta are constant, then this is not even a rotational invariant, not to mention the Lorentz invariant, okay? Because this derivative is not contracted by, by, any, uh, 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 by any other Lorentz indices. So alpha is just some constant, okay? So this cannot be Lorentz covariant. Even cannot be rotational invariant, okay? If alpha, beta are constant. Okay, uh, and uh, and psi is an ordinary function. Okay. So so um, yeah. So you can have alpha x partial x, alpha y partial y, alpha z partial z. Okay. So you can easily convince yourself when you rotate x, y, z, this is not symmetric because alpha is some constant, okay? And so, so I'm sure this idea came to many people trying to do some, look for some first order equation which are Lorentz covariant. Then after five minutes, you realize this is not possible, okay? This is just so simple, okay? It's just not possible, okay? But then, then Dirac made it work, okay? It's really, say, a stroke of genius, okay? It's really a stroke of genius because there's nothing. There was nothing like this before. 
just even from mathematical point of view, is purely, purely imaginative, okay? Just nothing like this before. Like when Einstein wrote down his theory, et cetera, you can still trace uh, there are some clues, okay? But when Dirac, this one, just really, <laughs> like music, just came out from his mind, okay? He <laughs> uh, just, and then he, rec then he reasoned, okay, if this is constant, which does not work, and then let's make alpha and beta to be matrices. Take them. Okay. And then, so let's say they are n, n by n matrices. Then in order for that equation to make sense, then psi has to be an a component vector. So even for some people to come up with this idea, you will not imagine this will work, okay? You just say, oh, this will be a mess. But somehow he made it work, okay? So we will see how to make this work. And so, so now if you want H to be Hermitian, and then you can immediately conclude, so that's why I put the minus I thing here, is that the alpha and the beta so M just be a, some constant, okay? And uh, here is a matrix, you can always take a constant out, okay? So, so alpha, beta are, are Hermitian matrices. They're just some constant of Hermitian matrices. And then, um, so, So then he, he reasoned that for this equation, if you want this equation to be Lorentz covariant, then at least it should have the relativistic plane wave as its solution. Okay, if you have a covariant equation, and at least you should have the uh, uh, relativistic uh, plane wave as its uh, a solution. If it does not even have that type of solution, and then, then you, yeah, of course, cannot be uh, uh, covariant, okay? So the minimal requirement, so before we really try to see how can make this into a, a covariant equation, he said, let's consider minimal requirement. So we'd like to, yeah, let me call this equation star. star should have plane wave solutions. With the standard relativistic Dispersion relation, okay? That is, you should have P squared equal to minus M squared. Okay, you should have a plane wave. The plane wave will be labeled by, by P, and then you should have P squared equal to minus M squared. Then M will be its mass, okay? Its mass. And to do this, the simplest way to do this, so we know that the Klein-Gordon equation, so we know the Klein-Gordon equation have such solution, okay? Uh, a Klein-Gordon equation have such solutions. And uh, 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 so, and then the simplest way to do this is, uh, 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 this is the first order equation. And now imagine if we square this equation, and then, uh, and then uh, this should reduce to the klein gordon equation. If you can, you can make that work, and then this uh, property will sat uh, be satisfied, okay? So, so, so this will be satisfied, can be satisfied 
if square of star okay, satisfies reduced to the klein golden equation. Okay, so now let's try to do this. So when we square this star, we just act twice. So essentially you have So you, you have, so when you square that equation, then you just get partial, partial t square psi equal to h square psi, okay? And then we try to make this of the this Klein, uh, Klein Gordon form, okay? So, so the right hand side, we just have the form minus i, this alpha dot with this, and then plus beta m square psi, okay? You have this. And then you can just expand this explicitly, so the right hand side. So then we have minus, then we have, let's square this first, then you have minus alpha i, alpha j, okay? And then you have partial, partial xi, partial, partial xj, psi, and then let's square these, then you have beta square, m square, psi, and then you have cross term, so cross term then have the form beta alpha i plus alpha i beta, but now remember beta and alpha, they are not constant, they are matrices, okay? So, so they don't necessarily commute, so you have to be careful about the orders, okay? And m, partial psi, partial xi. Okay, so the right hand side is just like this when you square it. And now we want it to look at the, the klein gordon equation. The klein gordon equation have the following form. So now we want it to be, okay, hope it to be the given by minus partial x square psi plus m squared psi, okay? So, so this one would be the klein gordon equation, okay? Uh, which we wrote before, okay? So, so by, uh, by x, yeah, uh, here, sorry, I should say xi squared. Yeah, okay? So i should be sum, okay? So, so now we want this equation, so, so we want the right hand side to be equal to this equation. If that works, then we guarantee it to have a plane wave solution, okay, uh, 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 of such a dispersion relation, because this equation has, okay, because this equation uh, 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 have the plane wave equation with, yeah, plane wave solution with that kind of dispersion relation. So, so now we just compare the both sides. So for this to be true, So we just need to have, so let's com compare the second order derivative term, and then we need alpha i. So we need, first, when i not equal to j, the off diagonal term, they all should vanish, okay, because here there's only diagonal term. So, so that means that the, alpha i, alpha j, plus alpha j, alpha i, should equal to zero. Okay, remember, uh, uh, the matrix, they don't commute, so we should be careful about the order, okay? So when i not equal to j. And when, when i equal to j, then you should just reduce to here, okay? Then that means that the alpha i square, should equal to, and here you should just 
Here you should just, uh, 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 this term just should give that, and the uh, uh, should equal to beta square equal to one. Okay, so here there's no summation, okay? No summation over i. Okay, so each alpha i square has to be zero. And then now we want this linear term to be zero. And then you, then you want beta alpha i plus alpha i beta to be zero. Okay? And uh, uh, also just uh, 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 let me put it together. We said the uh, 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 alpha and the beta, they must be Hermitian, okay? So that means that the alpha i dagger equal to alpha i and the beta i, beta dagger equal to beta. So if we satisfy all these four conditions, and then we will guarantee that that equation star should have the plane wave solution, okay? I should have the plane wave solution. And uh, so um, now you just try to find matrices, satisfy those conditions, okay? So. So we already said that the one by one matrix don't work, that if they are constant, of course they don't work. And uh, so you can also check two by two matrices. It's not enough to do this. Three by three is not enough. When you go to four by four, then you finally find the solutions. Okay, you actually find the infinite number of solutions. So, so, so you see that to satisfy them need at least four by four matrix. So, so n has to be four, okay? So this n has to be four. And so, so let me give you some possible solutions. So for example, here is one solution. Say we take beta to be one. So all matrix here uh, uh, should be understood as two by two matrices, okay? So all together is four by four matrix. So one and the minus so beta given by this, so this is one solution. And alpha i given by zero, sigma i, sigma i, zero. And the sigma are poly matrices, okay? Sigma i, poly matrices. Okay? So this is one solution, you can check yourself. Okay, I will not do it here. And uh, 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 this actually is a, a, a solution, uh, uh, satisfy all these four conditions. And, uh, and here's another solution. So, so now let me just save time, uh, uh, not writing down this two by two. So, so for example, beta can be zero, one, one, zero. Okay, this one here is a two by two matrix, okay? And alpha i equal to sigma i, zero, zero, minus sigma i, okay? So, so, so you can check both of them satisfy those conditions. Yes? Sorry, so when you have alpha times grad psi, is it, do you act the grad on each element of psi and then multiply by alpha, or do you, like what's the order of operation? Oh, it doesn't matter because, because alpha is, uh, 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 alpha is just some constant, right? Alpha and the grad, they don't act on the same space. So that derivative just act on derivatives, and alpha act on a different component of psi. I see, but if you took the grad of psi and then multiply by alpha, yeah. then you mix up the components of Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, you can do it either before. Yeah, they commute. So the operation of the alpha and the operation of grad, they commute. Yeah. And then you have another one for y and for z. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, so, so I urge you, so here I don't have time to write everything very explicitly. So here you just write it as alpha x partial x plus alpha y partial y plus alpha z partial z. And each alpha is a matrix. And alpha 
act on different component of psi, and this just act on the derivative act on all component of psi. Yeah. Okay. Good. So so now good. You say we have an equation. Okay. So so far so psi. So alpha is a four by four matrix. Yeah, alpha and beta are four by four matrices. So that means that psi should be four component vector. Okay, it's a four component vector. Okay, so so we will take, so we will denote as psi alpha. So alpha equal to one, two, three, four. Okay, and we call, uh, and we uh, for the moment let's just take the most general situation. We take it alpha to be complex. Okay, each of them to be com uh, complex. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Each element of alpha is a matrix. What do you mean? So like alpha i. Is yeah, alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. They're all. Uh, uh, they are three matrices. And when, when, when could we use like the first, um, the first like on the list? Wouldn't we want like each alpha i to be diagonal? Is that what you're saying? Like each matrix in alpha should be a diagonal matrix. No, 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 no. No alpha. No, we don't know the form of the alpha, right? No, alpha are just matrices. So this means alpha one, alpha two, plus alpha two, alpha one as a matrix product should give you zero. Yeah. Yeah, alpha itself is a matrix. Hmm? Sorry? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, just alpha have three components. Right. And each component is a matrix. And each component is a matrix. Just we have alpha one, alpha two, alpha three. So here, here you see explicitly alpha one is equal to sigma one, sigma one. Alpha two is sigma two, sigma two, etc. Yeah. Other questions? Okay, yeah, at the beginning this may be a little bit more intu uh, uh, not very intuitive, okay? But, but, but if you just walk through it, and you will get a feeling about it. Okay, you will get a feeling about it. So that's why I say this was a really genius because uh, just nobody could have thought of this. Okay, it just uh, it just uh, came from nowhere. Really, it was no clue. Okay, there's no clue of such a structure. Uh, uh, um, yeah. Okay, so so this is a new object. So we call it spinner. Okay, we call it spinner because it. Uh, Later we will see that this describes spin half particles, so that's why we call it spinner. Okay. Good. Yeah. So if we take n to be larger than this type, like all the things. Hmm. If we take like a particle that we can make matrix where n is not so common. No, you you just get the just uh, just we are not using those matrices in the efficient way. Yeah, just become, you can reduce always. Yeah, just for physical purpose, you can always reduce to form. Yeah. Yes? Well, well, what if I wanted a wave equation for like higher spin? Uh, for higher spin? Yeah, like three halves or five halves. Yeah, yeah, if you now know how to do the two half, then you can generalize. Yeah, yeah, so, so one half essentially, uh, uh, you can, yeah, based on one half, you can generalize it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. <coughs> Thank you. Yes? Uh, just to clarify, so. Alpha is it a two by two matrix of two by two matrices, or is just a four by four matrix? And that's just a convenient way to write. Yeah, this is a four by four matrices. Yeah. Just convenient way to write these four by four matrices. Sure. Okay. So that I don't have to write the uh, 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 all four component. I just yeah. 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 Okay. So I divided this four by four matrix into four two by two blocks, sure. and then I specify each block. Yeah, it's just blocks, not matrices yeah. in the matrix. Yeah, no, 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 just the blocks of that four by four matrix. Yeah, separate, separate the single four by four matrix 
into four two by two blocks. Mm -hmm. yep. Okay. Good. Um, okay. So so for later convenience, uh, 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 let's introduce a slightly different notation. Okay. So so now we have this equation. So now we have the form of this. So now we have the form of this partial t psi equal to my minus alpha plus beta and psi. Okay. So now let's multiply both sides by a factor uh, uh, by by beta. Okay. So beta is a fun. Beta is a matrix, okay? Uh, so this is a matrix equation, okay? So this is a matrix equation. Let's multiply both sides by beta, okay? And then we get I beta partial T psi equal to minus I beta times alpha Yeah, let me just write it maybe this way. So alpha i and partial xi psi, okay, then plus m psi. Okay? So so you get the equation like this. Okay. So now I will denote introduce a new rotation so that it looks nicer. I denote the gamma zero equal to I beta. And then gamma I equal to I times beta half I. <coughs> okay? And then let's all pull you to the same side. And then this becomes the following equation. And then the equation has the following form. Gamma mu partial mu minus m psi equal to m. So this is the form of our Dirac equation. Okay. So so this becomes gamma zero times partial t. So this becomes gamma i times partial xi. When I come together, then become gamma mu partial mu, and then then m I move to the other side. Okay. So due to different conventions of the Minkowski matrix signature you use, etc. So different books or different places, you will see I in different places. Some equations have I here. Yeah, some books have I here. Some books have I here. In my version, there's no I. Okay, <laughs> and uh, so so uh, uh, I know this is annoying, but uh, yeah, but this is just fact of life. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. So 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 I find that this version is most simplest in terms of rotation. Okay. Anyway, so so that's the convention we use. Good. Good. So, so so now again this is a matrix equation. Now let me just write it in the component form. Okay? So so this is in the component form. I have gamma mu, which it, each of them is a matrix alpha, beta. So alpha and beta they always run. Yeah, sorry for this. Uh, uh, now the alpha beta just uh, means the, uh, yeah, uh, means the indices. Okay, not the matrices. Um, so alpha and the beta, actually, convention is to write this like that. Okay, doesn't matter. So partial mu, psi beta, minus m, psi alpha equal to zero. Okay, so this is. Uh, a matrix equation, they are all together four equations. So the beta is summed because beta is uh, 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 repeated. So, so beta is summed, and then, uh, uh, um, yeah. And the mu is also summed. So this is a little bit intricate equation. Okay, so this is a little bit intricate equation. But, but once you get used to it, it's not that difficult. Okay. Yes. There's no like, meaning to the upstairsness or downstairsness of alpha and beta, right? Uh, 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 there's a meaning of upstairs, yeah, be, because this, uh, um, yeah, yeah, because these two uh, index are uh, a last metric, so it's easier uh, to put one upstairs, one downstairs. Yeah. Okay. And these two index are not symmetric. Okay. Um, right. Okay. So, 
So, so, so yeah, it takes a little bit time to get used to it, okay? And uh, um, I know some people that develop psychological fears for fermions <laughs> because you have to deal with those gamma matrices, okay? <laughs> for a long while, actually, I have this psychological fear myself. <laughs> but when I look at fermions, I want to be away from it <laughs> because I don't want to deal with those gamma matrices. But, uh, but these are beautiful. Uh, objects, uh, uh, if you get used to them. Um, okay, so now those conditions, we can also write them in a compact way, in terms of the gamma, in terms of those gamma matrices. Okay, so so one, two, three. Now can be written as, in terms of gamma matrices, gamma mu, gamma nu, plus gamma nu. Gamma mu, so mu nu is always from zero to three, okay, uh, um, equal to zero. So mu not equal to nu, and then gamma zero square is equal to minus one. It's because of the, this uh, gamma zero is i beta, and the beta square is equal to one, and then then gamma i square. So there's no summation over i here, okay? Just each matrix gamma i square equal to one, okay? And you can write this further in a more compact form. You can write this further in a more compact form. So you can write this more compactly as gamma nu, gamma nu, anti-commutator equal to two intermediate. So, so anti-commutator just means that if you have object, two object curly bracket means A B plus B A. Okay. So, so this is a key equation. Okay. So, so all the gamma matrices. So, so you can check yourself. Okay. All these are given by just this. You can easily see when mu not equal to nu, of course the right hand side is zero, so that just is equal to that equation. When, when mu equal to nu, when they're easier, uh, uh, when they're both zero, uh, then this gives you minus one, so that's corresponding to the gamma zero case. And then when they're ij, then corresponding to gamma i. Okay. And so this equation, and later a mathematician, of course, the, uh, study this, uh, a mathematician would say this is a beautiful object, and then they study this, so now it's called Clifford algebra. So, uh, so this object is called Clifford algebra. Okay. And uh, so uh, and any sets, of gamma mu, so gamma mu are a set of four matrices satisfying this equation. Okay, so, so let me call it star. It's called a representation. Clifford algebra. Okay. Okay. So um, so from these two solutions of alpha and beta, you can easily from here we can work out what is the uh, uh, gamma u and the gamma i. So so um. So here are two examples. Uh, also, yeah, before uh, talking about examples, also from, from number four, from number four, you also find that the gamma zero dagger equal to minus gamma zero. And the gamma, so, so gamma zero is anti hermitian and the gamma i is Hermitian. okay? And you can also write it this 
together in a more, more equivalently, I write it as gamma mu factor, gamma zero, gamma mu, gamma zero. Okay, so, so you can check that this equation is the same as this two equations. Okay? Yes? Do these representations generate a certain transformation? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 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 uh. I will talk about things related to this a little bit later. Yeah. Good. And then, then we can write down explicit solutions for those gamma. So that's two representation uh, from those solution of beta and alpha. We can write down different solutions of gamma. So, for example, for one, you corresponding to gamma zero, you go to minus i. So now this is minus i times the two by two matrix, okay? Or oh, i, zero, zero, minus i, okay? And the gamma i is equal to zero, i sigma i, minus i sigma i, zero. And the second solution there corresponding to gamma zero is equal to zero, i, i, zero. And then gamma i equal to Zero. Yeah, I think it's also minus i sigma i, i sigma i zero. Okay. Good. So these are just again. Uh, this just called. So these are two different representations of this edge. Okay. So now let me make some remarks. So so before I. Proceed further. Do you have questions? Yes. Um, so, to me, shouldn't the polynomial just be. Oh, never mind. Oh. Other questions? Yes? So I, I guess I don't understand what space this psi vector of the four actually is. Like, what is, what is that? Is this a Lorentz four vector? No, it's not a Lorentz four vector. Yeah. So, so, in what sense is it a vector? Like, how does it transform? Yeah, so this is a new space. We will talk about that. Yeah, yeah. So this is a new space, uh, and uh, 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 so that's called uh, this is called the spinner space. Yeah. Yes. Uh, how do you know? Are these the only two representations? Oh no, 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 no the, uh, the infinite number of them. Yes, uh, uh, I mentioned the infinite number of such solutions, and this is just two of them. Uh, yeah, I will comment on all those different solutions. Other questions? Okay, good. Um, so, um, so now let me make some remarks. Okay. So first, if you consider the case m equal to zero. Okay, if you can see the case uh, uh, m equal to zero, and then this is like for masses. So when m equal to zero, then when you reduce to this kind of body equation, what you get is the massless equation. Okay, okay, it's a massless equation, and then 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 you will have dispersion relation p squared equal to zero. Okay, so in this case. The original equation just become partial t equal to minus i alpha i partial partial x i psi. Okay, so that's your equation. Uh, there's no uh, this m beta term. You okay, there's no m beta term. So in this case, you just the same story. Just here, you just forget about beta. Okay, the same story. Forget about beta, and then you only need. Now you only need alpha i, alpha j, the counting commutator to be zero for, alpha, for i not equal to j. Essentially, just that equation one there, and then also you want the alpha i square equal to one. Okay, so so for any i. Okay. So so now these are the condition for the alphas, and now you can actually satisfy by two by two matrices. So what matrix satisfies this kind of relation? Poly. 
yeah. So, so the uh, so the Pauli matrices anti commute among themselves, and their square is equal to one. So you can just take alpha i. So, so this tells you something important. Tell you actually the equation for massless particle and the massive particle are very different. So, so massive particle you actually need the four components. But for the massive, but for the massless particle, you can describe by a sigma matrix here only two by two. Okay. So that means for massless psi. Can be described using two components. Vector. Okay. So that in this case, psi equal to psi one and psi two. Again, they are all just just complex. Okay. <coughs> Good, so, so, so this actually, yeah, we will elaborate on this later. So this actually tells you that actually the, the massive particle have more degrees freedom than the massless particle. Okay, more degrees than the massive particle. Good, and then the second, the second thing is what the uh, Dirac Essentially, it was Dirac's original motivation. So, from Dirac equation, you can show. Okay, you can derive a conserved current. Just as you can do for the Schrodinger equation. You can derive an equation like this for some j mu. And with j zero, with the zeroth component of this thing. Positive definite. Classically. So I emphasize this is classically. You will later you will see why. Okay. And this I will leave it to your P set. Okay? So this is very similar to the derivation of such a current in the in the case of the just non relativistic Schrodinger equation because this have the same structure. Yeah, the Dirac equation when we started has the structure of the non relativistic Schrodinger equation, and uh, um, yeah, so so you can show something like this at least. Okay, and then the third point is related to the question many of you may have. So. He said, what's the meaning of all these different solutions for alpha and beta or for gamma? Okay? So, so, so as I mentioned, you can have infinite number of solutions. What's the meaning of them? <coughs> so, so first, so first you, let's imagine when we look at this equation. So as I said, this is a, ma a, a matrix equation. So in this matrix equation, then you have this psi, which is on four component vector. Okay, on four component vector. So now let's imagine we make a basis change in this four component vector. Okay, so so imagine just uh, um, say consider making a basis change. Side. Okay, so a basis change in psi just means in linear algebra this is a vector. Means we can see a lot of psi prime, which is so we take psi to some other psi prime which is related to psi by invertible matrix. Okay, so B just some constant. 
complex immutable matrix, okay? So essentially, you just make a linear uh, 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 superposition of different components, okay? Uh, so, so, yeah. Okay, so this corresponding to a basis change. So now if psi satisfies this equation, psi satisfies this equation, you easily convince yourself that the psi prime Satisfy the following equation. The gamma mu prime partial mu minus m psi prime equal to zero, and the gamma mu prime is equal to c gamma mu d minus one. Okay. So, so yeah, so this is easily can be shown. You just multiply b from both sides. Uh, just multiply b to this equation. Okay, multiply b to this equation. And for this term, you can just directly the d psi give you psi prime. And for this term, uh, then you just get the b. And then here you can insert b minus one b. And then yeah, you get that. Okay, so, so, so this you can easily convince yourself. Okay, just a couple of lines. So now, so psi prime satisfy essentially the same equation but a different gamma matrix, okay? A uh, 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 gamma mu prime. So now you can easily check yourself, okay? So you can easily check yourself, this gamma mu prime also satisfies that algebra, okay? So you can easily check yourself. So, so then we conclude any set, since we can make a basis transformation as we want, okay, and the basis, so the basis transformation should not change physics, okay? So any set of gamma mu related by a similarity transformation Okay. Okay, they're equivalent. And because they should not give you new physics, just corresponding to a change of basis. Okay. So now here is a highly non-trivial mathematical statement. So so now, which of course I will not uh, 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 prove here, uh, because uh, just take too much. Uh, 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 yeah, so so you can show. I just quote the result. So you can show, okay, with a uh, um, little bit of effort, that under such kind of equivalence relation, means that the uh, similarity transformations they are all equivalent under such equivalence relation. The representations of star is unique. Okay? So you can show any matrices which satisfy that equation, they're all related by similarity transformation. Okay, so so they're all physically equivalent. They just corresponding to a change of basis. Okay, they corresponding to a change of basis.
Okay. So, but the different, different. Uh, uh, so, but different forms of the uh, gamma, they may different forms of the gamma matrices. They may uh, useful for different purpose. Okay. They may useful for different purpose. For example, uh, this one solution one we write down before is convenient for. If you want to take the long relativistic limit, for example, if you want to make a connection with the non relativistic quantum mechanics, and that's actually the most convenient form, uh, 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 the matrix to use. And the two is actually in the uh, uh, opposite regime. It's convenient for the ultra relativistic regime. Okay, so so depend on which regime. Sometimes you use different gamma matrices. Okay, uh, 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 they they make your algebra a little bit more convenient. So now having introduced the the the, the Dirac equation and then the structure of the Dirac equation. But still, we haven't showed that the Dirac equation is covariant. Okay, we just showed that the Dirac equation can have the plane wave solution, uh, and the plane wave solution will have a standard long uh, relativistic dispersion relation. Okay, so so in order to show that the Dirac equation is covariant, We have to show, we have to make a Lorentz transform and show that the Dirac equations are the same in every Lorentz frame. Okay, we have to show that. Okay, and uh, uh, we are running out of time, so so we of course we won't have time to do that today. But but let me just remind you how this Lorentz covariance works for the scalar case. Okay, so remember. So recall, yeah, let's just quickly recall for scalar, we have phi x. Then on the Lorentz transformation, so consider Lorentz transformation which x mu goes to x prime mu equal to lambda mu nu, x nu, consider such a Lorentz transformation. Okay, so and then then phi transform as falling, phi prime x prime, phi prime new phi divided at the new position should be the same as phi divided at the old position, okay? Or, yeah, let me just write it here, um, so that I don't have to waste. So, so the phi, or, yeah, just the equal to phi lambda minus one x, okay? So now if you look at the klein golden equation, let's see how this is covariant. Okay, so now let's see uh, in the different frame. Okay, so covariance means that when we go to a new frame, partial prime square. Okay, so this is means in the prime the coordinates minus m square and phi prime divided by the x prime. There must be uh, 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 yeah. So this is in the uh, in a lot of Lorentz frame. Okay. Uh, uh, so they have the same form. Indeed, you see these two are equivalent because this just equal to that, okay, trivially equal to that just by definition. And uh, and this is a Lorentz scalar, so this is also equal to that. Okay, so you see that the uh, the the klein gordon equation indeed is Lorentz covariant. Okay, it's the same in any frame. So now we want to show, okay. So now we want to show that the Dirac equation have the same property, okay? And that is much more non-trivial, okay? That's much more non-trivial. Again, it's a really ingenious, uh, uh, ingenious, uh, uh, um, yeah. Uh, but but we see actually it works, okay? So we will um, do it next time. <laughs>